Hi, I'm Jack and I want to talk about uh, sanctions, de-dollarization, global realignment, um, all the recent geopolitical developments since uh, Russia entered the war in Ukraine in February um, 2022. And this is now a month later, March 2022. Um, so. Um, I want to talk about how do sanctions work, what's, what are actual sanctions versus what the West calls sanctions. Then I want to talk about, I want to um, go in depth and explain how sanctions work. And I want to do this on, at the example of Cuba, the sanctions, the United States sanctions against Cuba. Because if you understand how the sanctions against Cuba work, the, the country that is sanctioned the most on the planet, then you understand how every sanctions work. And then uh, finally, I'm going to talk about the recent geopolitical and economic developments after Russia entered the war. Uh, so let's start with the first part. What are, what, what are sanctions and how do they work? Sanctions are a tool of the United Nations organization to punish a nation's misbehavior. They can be financial, economically, uh, personal or cultural. And um, they all require a United Nations Security Council resolution. If there is no um, resolution by the United Nations, then it's not sanctions, but it's just unilateral uh, coercive measures, meaning illegal unilateral economic warfare. Right? And, the two, and an example for successful sanctions by the United Nations would be um, the sanctions against apartheid South, Af South Africa. So the United Nations introduced multiple rounds of sanctions. Most of them were always blockaded by the, uh, by the United States because the United States was one of the biggest allies of apartheid South Africa. And in blue here on the map, you see all the countries that did not follow the United Nations resolution. So basically most of the countries um, you know, uh, accepted the sanctions against apartheid South Africa, but mainly the Western world um, and, uh, and the West, meaning Western Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and a bunch of cl um, client regimes in South America, and of course all the other apartheid states, Rhodesia, South Rhodesia, Israel, they also did not follow the United Nations resolution. Um, but still, apartheid was successfully defeated and the sanctions played a big role in um, defeating apartheid. But keep in mind, those were legitimate sanctions with a uh, corresponding United Nations Security Council resolution. And when you hear the word sanctions in the uh, news, so when people talk about sanctions in Western media, that's not what they are meaning. They're not talking about those um, sanctions being legitimized by United Nations resolutions, but it's instead this kind of unilateral coercive measures, un unilateral economic warfare. And it's basically when the West meaning Western Europe, um, basically this map here, right? For example, for example, West Germany was the biggest financial supporter of apartheid South Africa. They, of course, did not sanction, uh, did not follow the sanctions. And nowadays, sanctions is when the West tries to unilaterally destroy a sovereign country. Um, and what we always hear in the media is, uh, in Western media is this myth of smart sanctions or targeted sanctions, sanctions that are so specifically targeted that only the people at the top are hurt, right? And the average people, you know, the working class and so on, is not being targeted by the, these kind of sanctions. And I, I find a funny clip that uh, was making fun about this. I'm going to show it here. The West has been slapping these sanctions on countries for decades now. Yeah, and yeah, but... Come on, these aren't your regular everyday sanctions. They call this something completely different. Targeted sanctions. Targeted sanctions. More targeted sanctions. Smart sanctions. Smart sanctions. Smart sanctions. Oh yeah, the smart sanctions. These ones are so smart that they killed 576,000 Iraqi children in just four years in the 90s. No, no, no. Haven't you seen the news? Those are the old sanctions. These are the new smart sanctions. They're so advanced that they only target the people at the top of the regime. The order allows for targeting individuals. Target individuals. Okay, so there is no such a concept of smart sanctions or targeted sanctions. This is complete nonsense, right? Um, the, the, the ruling elite are the, are the last people to be affected by sanctions. It's the poor people, the working class people who are affected the most by sanctions. And I think this should be obvious, right? Um, 
And so what's the goal of, of this sanctions by the West? It's basically to worsen a economic or humanitarian crisis so that the, the populace get unhappy with the situation they find themselves. And this is what the CIA calls a regime change cli climate where they can overthrow the government and install a more Western aligned government. This is the stated goal of sanctions. Um, and now that I established, now that I made this claim, I want to explain how, I, I want to um, lead up to this by explaining the United States sanctions against Cuba. Um, because if you understand the sanctions against Cuba, you, the most severe sanctions on the planet, then you understand um, how sanctions how everywhere else also work. So here is a nice clip. Lift the embargo, says the United Nations, and the United States has its embargo around Cuba. So um, in Cuba there was a revolution in 1959, uh, and since the 1960s, meaning for 60 years now, the United States introduced numerous sanctions, and Cuba is actually the country that is sanctioned the most on the planet. And there's never been in, in Britain's human history a country that was living under sanctions for 60 years. Um, actually, I looked it up and I found that back in ancient times, uh, I think in 200 BCE, uh, Athens was sanctioned by Sparta during the Second Peloponnesian War um, for 35 years or so. So, okay. The, the, the sanctions against Cuba are not normal. This is a, not a normal sta uh, uh, situation. And since the last 30 years, since 1992, uh, the United Nations once a year votes on lifting the sanctions, lifting the embargo by the United Nations, by the United States. And here we can have a look at the development of this vote. So it started in 1992, and now we're skipping forward every year. It's a no new uh, vote against the embargo, and you see that basically most of the planet is against the embargo, except for the United States and a few client states. So we're now in 2009, 10, 11, yeah, and so it's basically all of the world and that is against the, the embargo. In 2019, in Bra Brazil voted against it, that's, that's when Bolsonaro was elected. Um, okay, so uh, the thing is that, okay, Cuba, the sanctions mean that Cuba can't, or the embargo means that Cuba can't trade with the United States, right? It can't trade. It can't export or import goods to the United States. But I mean, the United States only makes up 24% of the uh, global economy, right? So it's not that big of a deal, is it? I mean, you, you can still trade with three quarters of the, uh, of the globe. So what's the big fuss all about? I mean, it's not life-threatening, so to say. It's, it's bad, but it's not, it shouldn't be that bad, should it? Isn't it? Um, but the thing is that sanctions uh, by the United States cut you off from the rest of the world. So let's say Cuba wants to trade with Germany, for example. I'm German, I live in Germany, so let's say Cuba wants to trade with Germany. Um, the thing is that once um, a company is owned only partially by the United States, Cuba cannot trade with this company, cannot buy products from this company. So um, German companies that are partially owned by U.S. companies can't trade with Cuba. And in our um, globalized economy, this is basically means that every company that is exporting, every co company that is big enough to you know, be exporting goods is off the charts for Cuba. Cuba cannot trade with them. They can't sell to those companies and they can't buy from those companies. Well, okay, you know, that's, that's a bummer. But let's say Cuba finds a... Um, finds a company that is 100% German-owned, meaning 100% non-American company. Well, the thing is, once there is a, only one component, only one you know, screw or only one gram of, a kilogram of uh, United States wheat in the commodity produced, it means Cuba cannot buy this product. Um, uh, here is a clip from Cuba where they talk about this dilemma. The quality of life of the children would improve if the blockade did not exist. According to the director, the children's quality of life is affected by the impossibility to purchase certain items that would help their socialization and locomotion, such as electric wheelchairs. 
These electric chairs are not possible to purchase because they have U.S. components, so we cannot acquire them. Yeah, so she's saying exactly what I just told you. Um, so in the production of an electric wheelchair, you of course need electric parts, you know, um, control units, you need wheels and, you know, certain type of um, products that are needed to produce a wheelchair. And of course, in order to produce uh, those uh, wheels, you need you know wood or plastics or whatever. And in every in every step of the supply chain, C Cuba must make sure that it is a non-American company and that the products being used are non-American uh, are non-American products. And this basically cuts you off from the rest of the world because which which company on the planet knows from the end step of production to the beginning of production where its products are coming from. Is the wood in your wheelchair from uh, a, an American tree or is the gold in your control unit from, a, from South Africa? And maybe the company that is mining this gold is partially owned by the United States. And this basically means Cuba cannot trade with the rest of the world. Right, because let's assume let's assume that Cuba actually finds a company that is producing 100% with non-U.S. products and also knows this. You know, most companies are not aware what's coming from the United States or what has been coming from the United States a production step earlier. And so the question is, how does Cuba import this product? So let's say Cuba finds, let's say in China, for example, they find a wheelchair that they want to buy that is completely produced in China by Chinese companies. Um, the, you have to um, bring it in through ports, to, through vessels, to, through cargo ships. And any vessel entering a Cuban port cannot enter a US port for six months. And this, of course, means that uh, if you look at you know, global um, uh, sea routes, let's say you have a ship starting in Hamburg or in Rotterdam, they will um, ship to, let's say, the uh, east coast of the United States, Latin America, maybe even here, South America. Then they go through the Panama Canal uh, to Japan, Korea, Beijing, China, in uh, here, uh, the Philippines, uh, to Singapore, through the Middle East, Suez Canal, back to Rotterdam. That's a normal trade route, and this takes like three or four months. Let's say that um, a ship is sailing from China to Cuba, meaning it would say through the Panama Canal trade with Cuba and it cannot trade with the United States anymore. And in fact, it cannot use the Panama Canal anymore because the Panama Canal is owned by the United States. It's a canal in Panama, but the United States controls this canal. And this means Cuba has enormous, enormous import fees, right? They, it's a country that has to pay the most for importing simple goods. And so, for example, there's the thing is most Cubans have never eaten apples, right? Because there are no apple trees in Cuba. Cuba is in the in the Caribbean. Apple trees don't grow in the Caribbean, and because it's so expensive to import goods, it's not worth it importing apples, right? And so, when it, once I've hear, heard someone say that, oh, Cuba is this failed state, this failed communist state because they can't import, they, they, they can't even eat apples. Well, it's because of the US blockade, right? So, but let's assume you find a shipping company that is willing to trade with Cuba, that's basically going back and forth from, let's say, Spain to Cuba and back and forth. Um, how does Cuba pay for these imports? And SWIFT, which is a lot in the news recently, is the dominant global financial transaction protocol, meaning that's how different banks um, exchange money um, with each other. And SWIFT is a, a company that is partially owned by the United States. So this means that Cuba cannot buy most of the products on the, on the global market, they cannot import these products, and they cannot pay for these products. And this means that Cuba is um, essentially cut off from the rest of the world. And even if um, there are, even if humanitarian um, goods like food or medicine are not uh, sanctioned. That's why countries uh, still starve, right? Because you might be able to import food and medicine, but the company that is producing this medicine is sanctioned. The um, shipping those medicines into the port is sanctioned. 
and uh, and buying uh, and paying for the, those um, medicine or those those food commodities is also sanctioned, and that's the reason why um, even if you hear in the media that humanitarian aid is excluded, if, um, those countries still starve. Those countries still lack medicine and so on. And the United States is constantly imposing new sanctions under Trump. They introduced um, new sanctions, for example, that remittances were not allowed. People were sending money back to their relatives. This is now not allowed anymore. And the administration under Joe Biden um, even increased those sanctions made by Donald Trump. So we see there is not really a change in policy between, you know, the red Mega Maria Great again, the red MAGA and the blue MAGA, right? It's all... It's all the same, make America great again. It's it, uh, unimportant which um, which uh, party is in office right now. Uh, okay, and then a, a, a funny example would be um, the internet cables. So here you see a map of all internet cables, and you see how um, Cuba's access to internet is only through one cable to Jamaica, and another cable through to through Venezuela. This is the only access Cuba has through the internet to the internet, and all the other cables cables are going around Cuba. Right? This is also a part of the uh, of the blockade. So Cuba is is the most um, blockaded country on the planet, and this has certain implications. For example, Cuba has to uh, ration milk. Right? And so again, people say, look, at this failed state, at this you know failed communist regime, they even have to ration um, milk. But that's just a necessity because Cuba is not producing enough milk so that everyone can drink all milk all day. So they have to ration it for uh, newborn children, um, for, for, for little children. Um, uh, or, you know, uh, the, the United States is constantly trying to worsen the situation, constantly doing covert actions. For example, in the 70s, they introduced um, African swine fever. And so Cuba had to slaughter half a million pigs to um, stop the spread of this disease. And, and this is done constantly. Uh, there are so many covert actions done by the United States, done by the CIA uh, against Cuba. Um, yeah. And still, Cuba has a higher life expectancy than the United States. It has a, a lower unemployment rate than the United States. And Cuba complete, almost completely eradicated homelessness. So. Um, and here is actually the average um, caloric intake, um, daily caloric intake, and you see Cuba ranks 22nd out of um, all the different countries. And uh, after Cuba, there are countries like Denmark, Poland, Russia, Ukraine, Czech Republic, Iceland, Mexico, and so on. These are all countries that are not being under sanctions, yet still Cuba manages to produce enough for their people. Um, they are um, the first country to produce a, a vaccine against um, uh, lung cancer, and they produced four different vaccines against um, COVID. So Rana 2, so Rana Plus, Apsala, Mambisa, and I think Mambisa is the only vaccine currently that can be administered to um, children under the age of five years. Um, so they, um, you know, they um, had a much better response to the COVID pandemic. They only took, it, it took, took Cuba only half the time to vaccinate um, 85% of their population and there was no not really COVID until the emergence of the Delta, Delta variant. That's only when COVID deaths um, increased um, in Cuba. Um, so what, what I'm trying to say is that people always point out, this is just a side note, what I'm trying to say is that people always say, oh look, socialism doesn't work, look at Cuba, right, this failed state. In fact, there is not, not one single country in history that has survived 60 years of sanctions and has this um, great development in those key aspects. And if you go to the neighboring country of Haiti, you find that um, in many of those social indicators, life expectancy, uh, caloric intake, doctors um, per uh, people, um, they are much worse, despite not living under sanctions. But that's just an aside. Um, and now you understand how, what, how sanctions actually work. And just to... Um, to put it into reference, um, sanctions. You, you should. You should. Whenever you hear people talk about sanctions, you should think of sanctions as more deadly than atomic bombs. So in Cuba, again, 60 years of sanctions, they had around 200,000 excess deaths. Right, and actually, this quote comes from Fidel Castro or from Che Guevara. I don't know, 
actually who said it, but um, Cuba had 200,000 excess deaths in, in 60 years. Uh, they've now after 60 years they have ha adapted to these sanctions. They, um, for example, they produce enough food for themselves. Um, the city of Havana produces 90% of its food um, in within the city limits. Um, but still other countries, for example Iraq, which is also a country in the third world and has a capitalist mode of production, had um, a million children die through um, the sanctions, through 12 years of sanctions. In Venezuela, which is living under sanctions by the US and the uh, European Union for the last nine years, I think since 2013 or 14, they had 10,000 excess deaths. And Iran, which is also living under sanctions since the beginning of the 80s, um, has experienced um, 13,000 excess deaths since COVID-19. And the United States actually said that Iran was I Iran and Italy were one of the first countries to be hit by COVID. And in the case of Iran, the United States said, hey, wow, this is basically like a legal biological weapon. So they tightened their sanctions to, you know, make it harder for Iran to import medicine, for example. And for example, Iran had to introduce, uh, had to uh, fly, had to import uh, face masks uh, with their military um, aircrafts. They had to fly to the United Arab Emirates because because there was not a single company, a shipping company, um, or a naval company, or a you know air airliner that was willing to import those face ma masks into Iran. So they had to fly it in through their military. And in Afghanistan, since um, uh, 2021 half of the people, 50% of the population, are under the threat of starvation and 13,000 children already starved since uh, Afghanistan was hit with these sanctions by the United States and by the European Union. And then we have Yemen, where our, we, almost 400,000 people died, sanctions and war. They died through sanctions, through starvation and also through, through warfare by Saudi Arabia and the United States. And if you compare those numbers to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you realize that, wow, indeed, sanctions are more deadly than atomic bombs. And so you should, that's what you should keep in mind when you hear, when people talk about sanctions. So now that we um, know how sanctions work and how sanctions crush a people, sanctions do not hurt a regime or whatever, sanctions crush the ordinary people, you know, make them, they, they starve, they, they die. To, to, through the lack of cancer medicine or heart medicine. Um, now that we know how sanctions work, um, I want to um, elucidate the role of the US dollar as de facto reserve currency and how the US dollar is actually used to facilitate those sanctions. So um, the United States dollar is, since Bretton Woods, is a, since the end of uh, World War II, is the de facto reserve currency, and this has huge financial and geopolitical imp implications. So let's let's assume you're India, right? You, let's assume you're India. You have um, your currency are the rupees, and let's assume you print more money. Yeah, you just print more money. So this means the amount of money increases, but the buying power decreases, right? You you cannot create wealth out of printing money. The amount of money increases, the buying power decreases. Right, so overall you you gain nothing. Right, it's it's balancing itself out. You you can't create wealth just from printing money. So let's go to the United States. So the United States has its as its currency the U.S. dollar, and there are also a lot of foreign countries that also have huge sums of huge reserves in U.S. dollar. So let's I, I just picked some countries here randomly: India, Germany, Saudi Arabia, France, South Africa. So Again, let's assume that the United States prints more money, right? So they print more money, which means the amount of money is increased and the buying power is decreased. But the thing is that the decreasing of the buying power can be distributed to every country that holds a certain amount of US dollar reserves. So this means the amount of money is increasing, but the buying power for the United States is decreasing less because it can distribute this loss to all the other countries having uh, reserves of US dollar, um, ha having US dollar reserves. This means that the United States, by printing money, can actually create more wealth 
then it is destroying, so to say, or it, it can distribute the negative effects of printing money to other economies. And so this is why the United States is constantly devaluing its own currency. Here you see a map how the United States is constantly devaluing its own currency because they found certain mechanisms of benefiting from it, of creating wealth out of thin air. And this is of course a highly unstable process because um, you have to, you constantly have to force your currency onto others, right? And the concept, the reason why we trade oil and gas in petrodollar, the reason we have the existing petrodollar is a is a um, is a implication of um, this um, U.S. dollar hegemony, right? Because if every country needs oil and you can buy oil only in dollars, you also need dollars. And if you need dollars, the United States can force its currency onto you. And so this, the reason certain goods are only traded in dollar, it's, it's not only oil, but many goods are treated, uh, are traded exclusively in, in dollar, is because uh, is, has its implications in this, um, in this economic system. And so you have, economic sanctions whenever a country is trying to leave this currency system. You have military intervention, for example, in Libya, in Iraq. Countries get kicked out of SWIFT. And you should keep this in mind. So kicking countries out of SWIFT is a means of punishing other countries. Because if everyone is using SWIFT, if SWIFT is the global dominant system, and you kick one country out of it, this country is now completely isolated, as we've seen in the case of Cuba. And so this means the United States has to force its currency onto it because that's a main source of revenue. And this explains why the United States has this high military budget and is doing hybrid warfare against other countries, meaning economic siege um, to, uh, against other countries. Right? Because the United States has constantly have to punish countries that are not um, following its um, financial system. Or in other words, to, to make it short, the United States is an overstretched empire. And now let's assume, let's say we have different kind of countries and all those countries are trading with each other. And now let's say um, sanctions are being introduced against this country G, right? So this country is now completely isolated, as in the case of Cuba, um, and its economy will completely will be completely destroyed, right? It, there will be a huge humanitarian and economic crisis because this kind of is now completely isolated and in most cases it's a um, third world country, right? A third world country that cannot produce for itself. So let's assume another country gets um, sanctioned. So now those two can countries, they have nothing to lose anymore. So they start trading with each other, right? Alternative trade routes emerge. Let's say another country gets sanctions sanctioned now those three countries are trading with each other and you see how sanctioning other countries actually isolates yourself right if you if you are at the if, if, if ten people are at are playing a board game together and you say you you are not allowed to play anymore well at the end of the day you're gonna sit alone at the table and suddenly everyone else is playing a board game and you're alone at the table so by sa constantly putting out sanctions against foreign countries, what the, the United States and also the European Union is do, has been doing is isolate itself from the rest of the world. And you find, suddenly you, you might find countries that say, okay, you know, we don't care if we get sanctions, we're going to switch sides, so to say. Um, yeah, and so suddenly you will have um, alternative trading systems, alternative trade routes. And this is basically what happened. And this is, of course, um, being amplified by the fact that China is overtaking the United States as biggest trading partner. So the, um, the United States is losing its economic grip on the world, meaning countries say, well, we, we're, not, we're not dependent on the United States or on the European Union anymore because we pr import most of our goods from China. And so we can um, allow ourselves to, to get sanctioned by the United States or get sanctioned by the European Union in order to break free from colonialism, to break free from new colonialism. Right, so the rise of China, the rise of the East has been amplifying this process. And over the last you know, 10 or 15 years, we've seen the United States and the European Union throw out sanctions everywhere. They sanction a lot of countries. Um, 
And to, so to summarize, you have another country that's trying to break free from colonialism. It gets sanctioned and crushed. Alternative trade routes emerge. And this further weakens the United States or EU um, hegemony over the, over the global south. And this means that another country will try to break free from colonialism, to, to summarize it, basically. Um, and this means, in, for the last few years, the more you, you sanction other countries, the more ineffective sanctions get. And we are now living in a time where 35% of global populations live under, quote-unquote, sanctions by the United States. And I just mentioned a few examples. It's not the, the, this is not a complete list, but it's Nicaragua, El Salvador, Cuba, Venezuela, Belarus, Russia, Serbia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, South Sudan, and so on and so forth, right? And this, of course, means the West has isolated itself over the last few years, and this is a process that will be in increasing, right? Um, and here is a um, quote from Wikipedia. I don't really like Wikipedia because it, has, it is very biased towards um, the West, and a lot of people can write whatever they want to, um, completely anonymous. So I'm not a fond of Wikipedia, but even they admit that sanctions do not have the stated effect of overthrowing a government, but instead they um, basically isolate the West. So what do you do if sanctions don't work anymore? Well, you get Western interventionism, you get hybrid warfare, you get Iraq war, you get the war in Libya, you get the increasing military spending and so on. You get the encirclement of Russia, the encirclement of China. This is basically um, the, the, the mechanism that the West tries to um, keep its hegemony over the third world. Okay, so now that we um, understand how sanctions work and how the West is losing its grip on the global south and how the East is rising, we will talk about the recent geopolitical and economic developments after Russia entered the war in Ukraine. Okay, so um, the West so first of all, um, just for the record, um, the war started in 2014 with, and the Donbas has been constantly attacked by um, Ukraine. You know, 13,000 people died in the Donbas for the last eight years. And last month, Russia also joined the war in Ukraine. And this is, of course, against uh, international law. Russia did something that is not allowed by international law. I mean, NATO does this all the time. In the last 20 years, NATO invaded four countries. Um, meaning Yugoslavia, um, Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq. So, the, so um, we see that no one is abiding international law. And now Russia also is not abiding international law anymore. It's completely illegal that Russia entered the war in Ukraine. Um, but we're going to keep that aside, right? I'm just, I, I just want to talk about the um, geopolitical implications. So the West, of course, imposes sanctions against Russia, and they imposed the first round, a second round, a third round, a fourth round. I think they already imposed a, a fifth round of sanctions. But you see that um, only the Western countries, only the West is imposing those sanctions. So I found this map on Business Today, and uh, you see that it's only you know, Western Europe, and even uh, Turkey, which is a NATO country, is not introducing sanctions, right? It's only the, the Western world, NATO or EU countries, then of course uh, the United States and Canada, Australia, New Zealand is also not imposing sanctions currently, I don't know if it change in the future, and Japan. So we see that um, most of the countries in the third world, they are more or less ambivalent. They don't want to cut off their trade with Russia, and they don't want to cut off their trade with China. So they um, basically say, um, we, we, this is not something that is concerning us. We, we don't want to, we want to stay neutral in this conflict. Um, and uh, that's what, I, what, I, what I'm saying when I, when I mean that the West has been isolating itself through sanctions. Um, so uh, there are different foreign affairs. I don't know why, why I put that in here. That's the statement of the Polish government. Um, that's the statement of the Bolivian government. Uh, the Iranian government. You can, if you want to, you can pause the video and read all these statements. And this is the um, statement by the Cuban government. And in fact, so um, the Polish government says basically the war is Russia's fault. Um, Bolivia says um, urges everyone back to peace, but says not who is the perpetrator, so to say. So it it stays neutral. 
Sam goes for Iran, which also stays neutral. Or I think, oh no, they, the Iran blames NATO. Iran says this war is because the, the, the roots of the problem is because of NATO expansion through esports. And here is um, the Cuban government also saying it's NATO's fault. And here's the, um, another um, uh, statement by the DPRK. And I think this is the, the best statement I want to um, read it because I think they, they nailed the point. Um, the root cause of the Ukrainian crisis to totally lies in the hegemonic policy of the United States and the West, which indulge themselves in high-handedness and arbitrariness towards other countries. The United States and the West in defiance of Russia's reasonable and just demands to provide with legal guarantees for security, have systematically undermined the security and environment of Europe by becoming more blatant in their attempts to deploy attack weapon systems while defiantly pursuing NATO's eastward expansion. The United States and the West, having devastated Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya, are mouthing phrases about respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity over the Ukrainian situation, which was detonated by themselves. That does not stand to reason at all. The greatest danger in the world faces now is high-handedness and arbitrariness by the United States and its followers that are shaking international peace and stability at, at the basis. Their reality proves positive once again that peace would never settle on the world at any time as long as there remains the unilateral and double-dealing policy of the United States with which threatens peace and security of the sovereign state. I think this uh, hits nail on the on the head, I think this is the best analysis of this situation. Um, so, okay, so the West introduces sanctions against Russia, Germany halts Nord Stream 2, um, and here you see all the, the dependencies of um, Russian uh, gas in Europe. You see, most of the countries um, is, are highly energy dependent on cheap Russian gas, and in fact, for example, countries like Austria, which is a landlocked country, it imports 90% of its, of its gas from Russia. And in fact, Germany is contractually bound to transit gas to Austria. And if it doesn't deliver, it has to pay huge, enormous penalty fees. Right? So um, Germany is basically in an in a, in a, uh, in a energy crisis. Uh, or not, 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 not only Germany, but the rest of um, Europe. And most European countries say that Sooner or later, they're gonna drop those sanctions. I, I expect because many countries already said, for example, Austria said, we will join sanctions, but not when it comes to um, our our energy sovereignty, right? Because if your country is ninety percent dependent on Russian gas, yes, or in the case of Germany, forty percent, countries cannot in, um, stop importing gas because um, in capitalism, where you have no um, no reserves, no energy reserves, so to say. You know, your your whole, whole production chains, all companies will will stop operating. Right? This will be enormous economic catastrophe. So sooner or later, they have to find alternatives. They are now looking at Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or uh, the United States. Um, but so Russia is basically holding um, Europe um, in its hand when it comes to energy. Um, so Russia is being kicked out of SWIFT, and um, this is the first industrialized country and the first big power to get kicked out of SWIFT. And in fact, many EU um, players like Germany were against this move, um, because kicking Russia out of SWIFT uh, means that Russia will join this club of sanctioned countries that have alternative trade routes. And this is the first industrialized country to, to get kicked out of SWIFT, and SWIFT will lose its um, global dominance when Russia is kicked out, meaning this is the beginning of the end of US dollar hegemony, right? Because what are alternatives to SWIFT? There is CPI, CIPS, which is the Chinese alternative to SWIFT. There's the Russian version, SPFS, which has been used internally, but um, they connected, uh, um, they, um, there are a lot of foreign banks connected to this um, Russian SWIFT, so to say, Armenia, Belarus, Germany, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Switzerland, and China and Iran are actually planning now to joining this um, this um, SWIFT alternative. And the member states of the European of the Eurasian uh, Union, which can be seen on the right here, meaning Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and even Cuba, Moldova, and Uzbekistan, they will are also planning on joining um, this alternative. Then there's the Indian alternative. 
and last but not least there's index but this is not being used index is uh, just a curiosity born out of the reason so um again because iran is being sanctioned by the united states iran has been uh, kicked out of swift but europe has a large demand for energy right so europe tried to circumvent those sanctions by swift and so they created their own system it's called index but it's now not really being used currently and so it's in, it's irrelevant but what um germany what, what russia did actually they did it last year last year russia joined cips the chinese swift alternative so i thought that they will never get kicked out of swift because this would be suicide for swift right because they are there are already so many alternatives to swift so russia immediately further integrates into cips and this already this process already started in 2021 um, russia and india agree on direct ruble rupee exchange protocols meaning basically russia and india are uh, hooking up their um, different um, financial protocols that are mentioned earlier here um, russia and mongolia announced the power of siberia 2 pipeline and the power of siberia 2 pipeline will basically connect the uh, western pipelines to the eastern pipelines and Nord Stream 2 has a um, uh, is, is transporting 55 billion cubic meters of gas annually and power of Siberia 2 will put, um, uh, distribute 80 billion cubic meters of gas annually so basically what, what, what Russia was saying is okay if Europe does not want our cheap gas we're gonna sell it to China because China currently is importing extremely expensive gas from the United Arab Emirates or from Saudi Arabia and so on and Russia basically says okay so if we don't can't sell it to Europe we're gonna sell it to Asia to China because China has huge demands for energy and currently China is paying a lot of money for uh, introducing this energy into their market and so whenever people say oh we're gonna stop Nord Stream 2 and, and that will you know crush the Russian economy um, that's not how it's working Russia will simply go sell to another player and in fact China will now can now reduce its um, in, uh, its dependency on the United Arab Emirates which is very expensive gas and probably Europe will then have to buy this expensive gas right so um, what, what we now find is basically both sides of the conflict NATO and, or, or and Russia are throwing both throwing out their joker cards their, their, their they both are activating their trap cards so to say and uh, we will see who who's winning this this trade war so to say um the united states and eu companies pull out of the russian economy and again i would argue that in short term this is means an enormous suffering for russia's economy but in the long term this means basically that europe is handing over their monopolies in the russian economy to russian companies and because uh, russia is um, food sufficient the prices for food rose only slightly so you will not see mass starvation in russia meanwhile the prices for foreign goods meaning you know electronics smartphones and so on they rose strongly um, and an example of how basically the west handed over on a, on a silver plating handed over their monopolies was when mastercard and visa pulled out of the russian economy the russian version mir just basically overtook the market right and now everyone is using not mastercard but mirror as their um, credit cards right so i would argue that in the long run um china is re is regaining uh, excuse me russia is regaining a lot of let's say economic sovereignty because if you think about it isn't it crazy that russia or china or whatever is using a american um credit card system from an american company if you think about it um this will make the the russian country more the russian economy more, more sovereign regain sovereignty um, so the united states seizes russia's central bank us dollar reserves and this is this has never happened that a whole country's um, dollar reserve has been seized has been frozen this only happened um, less than 12 months ago in afghanistan in 2021 and so this means two things first of all russia is no longer dependent on the us dollar because they are now completely decoupled from the dollar 
and this also signals to the rest of the world that because this, this happened now twice in in less than a year in, it happened in Afghanistan that's why people in Afghanistan are starving and it happened in in Russia now and this basically signals to the rest of the world that your money is no longer safe in the United States right it was seized in, uh, in Afghanistan it was seized in Russia and it might be seized in another country that is quote-unquote misbehaving so now that Russia is no longer dependent on the US dollar they immediately announce that they will sell gas and oil in the future to their so-called unfriendly countries they will sell it only in rubles right and to friendly countries they um, will sell it in any preferred currency so for example um, Russia and Turkey um, uh, talked about selling gas to Turkey and Turkey basically said um, and, and, and the Russians basically said that you, we can sell in ruble, we can sell in Turkish lira, or in, you know, we could even sell in Bitcoin if you want to, right? I mean, this was obviously a joke, but you see that Russia is very flexible now. Um, and this also had um, the, um, meant that the Russia, the ruble actually stabilized. So it went from 78 for one US dollar to 135 to around 100. And so, what you always hear in the media that the ruble is in complete downfall no not really the ruble i mean it, it got worse right it changed by like 25 uh, percent or so so it got worse for the russian economy but it's not total economic collapse it's not hyperinflation or whatever um and then of course russia announced um countermeasures against the western sanctions and keep in mind that 30% of global grain exports come from Russia. Russia is producing large amounts of wheat. And Russia is also the biggest exporter of potash fertilizer. And they also, Russia and China also produce 50% of global neon gas, which is needed for semiconductor production. So um, this means that um, this is a, a huge hit to Western economies. And uh, in countries like Germany or in Europe, we might see problems with um, the supply chain of food products because, you know, those countries has, have to import large amount of fertilizer and also import large amount of food, right? Um, and there was this um, speech by Joe Biden where he basically says that, you know, we should expect a real food shortages due to the Ukraine war. So he's admitting that it's a dire situation for um, the United States. But honestly, um, the United States is pretty much food sufficient. So I don't really think that this is really true. I don't think there's going to be that big of food shortage in the United States. I think Europe is in a much dire situation, but we will see what's going to happen. Um, so the United States then goes to Venezuela and Saudi Arabia because they're in they're needing oil. 3% of the United States oil imports are from Russia. The United States is almost completely energy sufficient. They are producing large amounts of oil themselves. Um, but they now by sanctioning Russia, they, ha they need to um, stabilize their oil imports. And so they go to Venezuela. And they say, basically, we're going to lift the sanctions against Venezuela, which basically means that 100,000 people over the last nine years starved completely for nothing. Right? Th those sanctions against Venezuela for the last nine years were completely for nothing, right? Um, and Venezuela actually, um, they they have adapted over the last nine years, just as Cuba has adapted over the last 60 years. So Venezuela has adapted, um, they have um, increased their own food production, their own industries because of the sanctions. And so Venezuela is basically is, is taking its time now. It's, it's not in a hurry to get rid of the sanctions. And they are now um, the United States now has to talk to Venezuela on on equal footing. Um, and here is a um, a clip from Telesur um, about um, the Venezuelan response to basically the United States begging for oil. Hi, this is from the South Amer News anchor Diego Martin from the Telesur studios in Havana. We begin with the news. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro announced that he held a meeting in the capital of the country, Caracas, with a delegation of the U.S. government, calling it very diplomatic. We had a meeting. I could describe it as respectful, cordial, very diplomatic between the delegation of the government of the United States and the thinning of the Venezuelan government that I cherish. 
we did it in the main presidential office, in office number one. There were the flags of the United States and Venezuela and the two United flags look at beautiful as they should be. We had almost two hours talking. Likewise, the head of the Venezuelan state, Nicolas Maduro, affirmed that a work agenda on the welfare of the peoples of the Americas and the Caribbean has been agreed upon with the state delegation. We have agreed to work on a forward agenda, issues of interest. I thought it was very important to talk face to face with topics of the utmost interest of Venezuela and the world from respect and from the maximum hope of a better world, we can advance in an agenda that allows the peace and peace of the peoples of our hemisphere, of our region, of Latin America and the Caribbean. That's the main thing. So Venezuela is basically um, now using its position to negotiate, to really negotiate, um, because the United States now has to talk to Venezuela on an equal footing. right? It's not longer colonial master against the third world. They now have to talk on equal footing. Um, so it's in no rush to help the U.S. They, they, Venezuela knows that um, most of, in the case of Iran, right? In the case of Iran, there was the Iran nuclear deal, but the United States pulled out of it and reintroduced its sanctions. So countries know that once they're getting sanctioned by the United States, it's highly likely that they will continue their sanctions. So Venezuela knows this, and they know that just because just be, just selling oil to the United States does not mean that maybe in two or three or four years they will reintroduce their sanctions. So they take their time, basically. Um, and in fact, Venezuela and Iran both joined the Mir um, system. Saudi Arabia announces that they want to sell oil in Chinese yuan and this is a huge implication because Saudi Arabia was the first country that, that sold its oil in US dollar and basically started the whole US the, the whole petrodollar system and now they're shifting because even Saudi Arabia realizes that um, the the west and you know the United States and Europe they are losing basically and the East, meaning China, is rising. So the United, Saudi Arabia announced that it will also trade in Chinese yuan. So again, we see how um, the West has isolated itself. Iran can import oil, but the West does not want to sell with, to trade with Iran, right? Saudi Arabia says, well, we're already at capacity, at full capacity, and we want to orient our economy towards China. Venezuela is under sanctions and says, you know, we're not going to trade with Europe on, on, on we're only going to trade with Europe on our terms, not on their terms. So we see how the West has isolated itself. So the United States now threatens India and China with sanctions if they don't sanction Russia. And this basically does not work. I, I'm going to show this small little clip. Um, it's a little bit annoying. I'm, I'm not going to show the full clip, but just to, you know. What you're seeing is the West organized solidarity against no, Russia. No, 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 West. The nations no, 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 Sorry. So it's not two-thirds of the nations. We see it's only the West. Sorry. What you're seeing is the West organized solidarity against no, Russia. No, 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 West. The nations no, 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 Professor, Professor We're Kapsi. seeing serious sanctions professor. against Russia. Yeah. Most of the world now, is coming together now, against professor. Russia. India should get off the fence. Okay, now I'll tell you something, Professor Kapsi. And I hope that you will allow me a, a decent response and then Ambassador Pawan Varma will respond to you. I see John wants to respond to you. First, I'd like to. First of all, with the greatest of respect, Professor Charles Kupchin, you have no moral standing to talk. You are in no position, you as in America, America is in no position to pretend to be the guardian of democracy and human rights. You are the worst perpetrator of atrocities. You in Barack Obama in 2011 intervened in a nascent Libyan civil war, you know, using the NATO and Arab League partners prolonging the war for one decade. You, you launched armed conflict in at least six countries. Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Niger. You carry out drone strikes. You've killed thousands with your drone strikes. You run Guantanamo Bay. 
You're dealing with India. We're a big country. We're not your satellite state. So don't lecture us on what we need to do. We are going to look out for yourself. You talk about, you use the phrase geopolitical expediency in, in place of values. You lecture me as an American to an Indian yes, on values you. and you say I that we are acting in geopolitical expediency. Brain. Let me, let me, let you me, allow me, allow me to complete. Insane. Allow, allow me to complete. They, they could have... Uh, they could have removed that stupid music, but okay, that's how it is. Um, so we see that basically the West is trying to threaten, so to say, India and China. If you don't sanction Russia, we're going to sanction you, right? But because the West has isolated itself, um, it, it can't really sanction China, uh, India. Because when the West sanctions India, India will move into the hands of China, right? And this is a... the, the West does not want this to happen, right? Um, so then we have another clip here from um, a Mexican politician. Se necesita desvergüenza para que un vicepresidente de la Cámara se haya ido a poner de tapete del Parlamento Europeo un paniaguado que se iba de boca a aplaudirle al Parlamento Europeo en su posición injerencista, majadera, insolente, racista, clasista e inaceptable. No somos colonia, hipócritas, detrás está la reforma constitucional en materia eléctrica. Lo que están defendiendo son el saqueo de 490 mil millones de pesos al año que las empresas europeas de electricidad están saqueando al país. De eso estamos hablando y lo vamos a decidir en unas semanas y vamos a sacar adelante esa reforma constitucional y ya podrán sacar un segundo resolutivo de su hipócrita preocupación sobre los derechos humanos y sobre la situación de los periodistas en México. Masacraron al pueblo entero los gobiernos de Peña y el usurpador de Calderón y el Parlamento Europeo cayó como momias toda esa masacre brutal y ese sufrimiento del pueblo de México. Han validado a dictadores y han validado a gobiernos a absolutamente rapaces, corruptos y contrarios a los intereses de su pueblo. No les preocupa ni les ha preocupado nada, nunca a nuestro pueblo. Lo que les interesan son los pesos y centavos de sus grandes empresas transnacionales que piensan que somos tierra de conquista. Se acabó. Óiganlo bien y óiganlo lejos. Se acabó el robo, se acabó el expolio, se acabó el saqueo. Llámenle como quieran. No lo vamos a tolerar más. No estamos pintados. No somos sus juguetes. Servimos al pueblo de México y a nadie más. Y lo servimos con enorme honra, con compromiso, con honor y con orgullo. So, this is what I mean when I say that um, the third world knows what's going on. They, the third world know the double standards of the West, right? And they know that the West uses words like um, solidarity or human rights or whatever in a very um, propagandistic way, right? And it's not very honest. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's the excuse, you know, human rights or women's rights. In the, in the case of the Af Afghan war, the war against Afghanistan, they, they talk, talked about women's rights. Um, those are just excuses to crush other nations, to destroy other nations, and to keep global dominance, right? To keep, to keep hegemony. Um, so the United States now removes sanctions against China. So basically, they it seems to me that they um, are in a certain economic, in, di in dire economic situation. Um, but China says we will our friendship with Russia is rock solid because um, over the last. Well, I would say 10 years or so, um, the anti-Chinese propaganda by the West has increased massively. And China was driven, China and Russia and, and Iran were driven to, to, together, right? Russia, China, Iran are all members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and they even make military um, uh, maneuvers together. And it's not that China and Russia like each other, so to say. I mean, there was the Soviet, Sino-Soviet split in the, under, um, back when Russia was still the Soviet Union. So there are also, um, there, there were situations where China and Russia did not like each other. But because the West has been so, um, has, has trying to keep primacy, um, they basically pushed all its enemies together. And China, Russia and Iran know that we're not gonna join the West now to destroy Russia because then we're going to be the next ones, right? After, after the West has destroyed Russia, it will try to destroy China, right? And so they, they basically say our friendship is rock solid.
Um, so, and, 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 and that's the, the point I'm trying to make is, um, I would argue the root cause of the conflict, and major economic and political analysts agree, um, for example, Michael Hudson or um, uh, Sang Waiwai, I think, um, that this is not a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, but in fact, the root causes of this conflict are a, a economic conflict between the United States and the European Union. So now let me explain this. Um, so basically we have um, two rivaling imperial blocs. We have the established imperial hege hegemon, which is the United States, and it, it's basically controlling the rest of the world right, through neoliberal, neocolonial policies. And then you have a rivaling emerging uh, rivaling uh, imperial bloc which is emerging which is the European U Union now the European Union or basically Europe so to say is um, dependent on Russia but also dependent on the United States it has dependencies on both sides it's, it's playing both sides so to say right and um, of course those imperial blocs dominate the third world dominate the second world the BRIC countries and of course, there are also the sanctioned and or anti-imperialist countries. And NATO, you could argue that NATO now is a tool by the United States because NATO is not a defense ally, a defense alliance by Europe. It's NATO is controlled by the United States. The highest commander, highest military commander, the, is the supreme allied command for Europe, the soccer. And um, that's always an American. Uh, NATO always has a European spokesperson. It's right now it's Jens Stoltenberg, but the the guy calling the shots, actually calling the shots, is always the United States. And so you could argue that NATO is a tool to um, to cut Russia and to cut off ties between Russia and Europe, right? Um, and you can and this is Russia always um, Russia basically says this. Russia says. Look, and the West always meant NATO always manufactures an, a new scandal. They manufactured Navalny and Skripal. There's always going to be a new um, a new um, scandal that will force the European Union to introduce more sanctions against Russia. And it was a long stated goal since the Obama administration and then since the Biden administration to cut off Europe through Nord Stream two from from Russia. Um, and so what we've seen is that they basically complete they, they they were successful NATO was successful and Russia is now completely divorced so to say from the European or American economy and uh, this means that Europe is now completely dependent on the United States so the United States now dominates Europe and together they dominate of course the third world but Europe basically has now been colonized if you if you want to be very cynical you could argue that Europe has been colonized by the United States and Russia is now being driven into the list uh, into the into the hands of sanctioned countries, countries like China, and into the hands of you know Brazil. Brazil also abstained from the United Nations vote um, uh, against uh, Russia, I think, uh, or at least they did not introduce um, sanctions because Brazil is also a country that is part of the BRIC system, the BRICS countries, and Brazil is um, trading with Russia in order to have economic um, growth. Uh, so what we see is that Russia is now um, further driven eastwards, so to say, and they, the trade between the the south-south trade, so to say, will increase, right? And this will further weaken the domination of the imperialist powers towards the third world. Um, and of course, this will basically, um, when, when those powers, the, the, the whole, all of finan the financial system of the United States and Europe, um, the, the basis of those systems is the exploitation of the third world. And there was never an empire that um, gave up its, uh, its uh, domination uh, peacefully, right? So, um, and, and the Venezuelan president actually said that we're already living in the third world war and it's, right now it's just on a pre-kinetic uh, phase it's just an economic warfare. Um, yeah, so, um, and here is an example for the United States fully dominating Europe. Madam President. So, excuse me. So this is uh, Ursula von der Leyen, which is um, the former um, member of the government, of the German government, and she's now the head of the European Union. Because 
the European Union is pretty much dominated by Germany. Germany is calling the shots in the European Union. And here is a nice speech where Biden basically says that, you know, we're going to sacrifice Europe for in order to crush Russia. Madam President, I know, I know that eliminating r Russian gas will have costs for Europe. But it's not only the right thing to do from a moral standpoint, it's going to put us on a much stronger strategic footing. And I'm proud to announce that we've also reached another major breakthrough in transatlantic data flows. Privacy and security are key elements of my digital agenda. And today... Yeah, he's not talking about digital agenda, whatever. I, I don't really know what, <laughs> why he's mentioning that. But he's basically saying that we're going to sacrifice Europe in order to hurt the Russians. Uh, and just standing there next to him like a, like a, like a lap dog, like a vessel, right? It's, it's, it's crazy, right? And the, the, the East is rising, China is rising since uh, the era of Xi Jinping. And so far, 140 countries joined the Belt and Road Initiative. The last country that joined the BRI was Argentine. And um, while the West always says that, okay, um, China is imperialist, China is also exploiting the third world and exploiting Africa, right? But um, think about it. Do you really think that three quarters of the of the of the planet are corrupt and are are governments that are bought by China and and are living in a debt trap, so to say? No. All those companies are orienting themselves eastwards, right? And if you if you look at the map, it's Italy and Turkey, right? Many uh, many uh, or Austria, many. Um, members of the West are looking eastwards because they know the future is in the East. China has already overtaken the US economy and it is, will only rise further. Um, and so this is the reality that the West has to face, right? Um, so the West always puts out um, news articles about the Belt and Road Initiative being imperialist or being a so-called de debt trap. There is this anecdote of um, a port in Tri Sri Lanka which is basically made up and then there's another anecdote about an airport in Uganda and the Ugandan um, foreign minister said it's complete bullshit this is complete made up we 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 love our relationship with China and here is a clip from uh, the Kenyan president after um, the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi met the Kenyan uh, minister and um, after they built a new oil refinery in Kenya and he says Kenya or Africa does not need lectures from the West. Kenya, Africa needs friends who want to work with us, and China is such a friend. This is the new Kipevu oil terminus that's being constructed in Mombasa. President Uhuru Kenyatta and the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi visited the new facility, which, when completed, will double the capacity of transit petroleum products handled there from the current 35,000 tons. It's being financed by the Kenya Ports Authority and constructed by the China Communication Construction Company. I'm sure that as we move forward with the kind of pace of development that we now have achieved, we will be able to say we have achieved an end to poverty. Kenya, Africa does not need lectures. Kenya, Africa needs friends willing to work with us to achieve our goals and our aspirations. Okay, and no, of course, Western media says, oh, obviously, this Kenyan president is bought, he's bought, he's bribed by China. Um, but think about it. Do you really think that all of Africa is corrupt and all of Africa is you know, stupid and is falling into a debt trap? Or maybe if, 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 you have, if Africa looks at trade deals from Europe and trade deals from China or, or the United States, why are they all preferring the deals with China? Right? Maybe the deals with China are better than the deals with the IMF, with Europe, with the United States. And here are some examples. So um, he, the uh, Ethiopia wanted to build a rail, railway. And so they, I think it was, this was in 2014, and they asked the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, if they could get a loan. And the IMF basically said that you know this is not um, we this is not um, economical uh, econ this is not beneficial for us, and um, 
so we can't we can't give you a loan, right? Because the IMF or you know, Europe or the United States is not interested in long-term development in Africa, right? Because this mean this means they will lose their hegemonic um, power grip over Africa. They will lose their colonial influence over Africa. And well, then Ethiopia went to China and said, "Can you guys build a railway for us?" And China said, yeah, okay, we, we will build the railway. We, will, we won't do it for free, right? We, we, we're not living in a fairy tale. Um, we, of course, we want to benefit from it as well. Um, and here's Western media saying that, oh, look, the Chinese owned Hua Jian shoe factory is in Ethiopia, um, but no one is going to build a railway just to connect a shoe factory to a, um, to a naval port in Djibouti. This is... Um, this is uh, nonsense, right? But of course, China is benefiting out of this. Um, the, the the concept of the Belt and Road Initiative is win-win cooperation. And um, so here's the um, for Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, and he basically says the similar thing. I want to show this to because because we in the West have this mindset of you know African Africa is poor, not because it's being exploited but because their leaders, their presidents are idiots, right? That's, that's this very arrogant, very racist mindset. The, the, all those African, all those uh, third world country leaders, they're just corrupt um, oligarchs or whatever. And here's a, a interview with the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands. China and the Solomon Islands established formal diplomatic relations on September the 21st. And within one month of that, you came to China to visit. I understand this must be a very important decision for your country and of course for uh, people in China, for China. So people must be curious, how did you come to make that decision? Yes, yeah, you say it is a very, very important decision. It uh, took us 36 years to make. And as a member of the United Nations, we are duty bound to acknowledge and recognize Resolution 2758 of 1971. China is a growing, powerful economy. One day, it will overtake the United States as the biggest economy. That's a fact, a reality, that every nation of the world need to appreciate, and especially developing countries that are aspiring to, to move forward in development. You cannot, you cannot disregard the important position, economic position, that uh, the People's Republic of China uh, has in the, in, in the global global. So those are some of the reasons. And we made the decisions. We, we I believe this is the right decision, is the correct decision to make. And uh, we are just moving forward, seeing that China is a very, very important uh, economic power in the world and all sensible leaders in the world must acknowledge the existence of, uh, of, of China and relate to it in a meaningful way like we do now. It seems to me that China and the Solomon Islands have a lot to cooperate on in the future, but can you tell us a little bit about where is it starting in the very near term? Well, we've signed a number of uh, <coughs> MOU, MOUs, uh, Memorandum of Understanding now. One is on the, uh, we will work together on the uh, the uh, uh, constructions of uh, strategic uh, uh, infrastructures. Um, the country is badly in need of uh, uh, important infrastructures. If we need to uh, look at some of our potentials, like potentials in tourism, for example, in agriculture, uh, and, and, and uh, sectors like that, you need important infrastructures to connect uh, the, our various island provinces to the main center on air, which is the, that's where all the marketing uh, happens and that our minister, our minister of Education officials and the minister himself will lead a delegation here in a uh, in few uh, uh, days' time to come and start to look at uh, uh, institutions where our, uh, our students uh, will go. Uh, potentials in minerals and, 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 uh, uh, and forestry and in fisheries and, 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 and tourism, as I've mentioned. These are areas that we can, uh, uh, we can work together uh, for win-win. For you know, your investors come to, into the country to invest. Uh, we benefit out of it. Uh, you know, China also benefits out of it. So you are already our biggest trading partner in the world.
And talking about connectivity and infrastructure, what about the China proposed Belt and Road Initiative? Where is it um, in the national development of your country? Uh, infrastructure development is a, a, a key uh, strategic uh, um, actions to, to drive uh, development uh, forward. And, and the uh, Road and Belt uh, Initiative is, is right in the, in, in the core of it to achieve that, uh, that very serious uh, uh, objective. So we're working very closely with uh, China on that. Okay, um, and here's another clip. It's from the. Uh, it's uh, it, it, short because it's. Um, uh, they talk about you know what are the main principles of the Berlin Road Initiative. So let's just watch this clip as well. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Mr. Foreign Minister, thank you for being with us here today. A new era of cooperation between the Solomon Islands and China is unfolding as the two countries just announced to establish diplomatic ties. Uh, at this very specific historic moment, can you share with us your expectations of future cooperation with China? Thank you, and thank you for the, the opportunity to be here and to share uh, a few thoughts um, with the new relations that uh, we have established uh, uh, with um, uh, China, the People's Republic of China. Uh, we are from the same region, the Asia Pacific uh, region. Uh, so there are opportunities for us through South South cooperation uh, to work together with China as we uh, begin this new chapter, this new beginning in our relations. Last year, Chinese President Xi Jinping made a four point proposal during a meeting uh, with leaders of eight Pacific Island countries. And he said, quote, first to treat one another as equals and deepen political mutual trust. Second is to stick to the mutually beneficial cooperation for common prosperity. And third is to increase the friendship among the peoples. And the fourth, to safeguard fairness and justice. I wonder, what do you make of the points? These are very important uh, uh, principles and values. Equality, mutual respect, and progress are all principles that we, we share. Yes, also on the same meeting, uh, the cooperation of China and Pacific Island countries under the BRI was very highlighted. I'd like to hear your remarks about the China proposed BRI and the China's vision of building a community with a shared future for mankind. This is a very important uh, initiative, the BRI. Uh, we do understand uh, it relates to infrastructure development, communications, uh, connectivity. So we are going to consider also signing up to the BRI because we believe it will also address some of the opportunities in terms of uh, development, especially in the infrastructure, transport and communication sectors. And this year marks the 17th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. Okay, so um, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is here is that, look, maybe these leaders are corrupt. Well, probably they are, right? Who, who isn't corrupt, right? But we see that these guys are pragmatic. They realize that China is rising. They want to get, get a share of the cake, so to say. And they're now focusing eastwards, right? Because they see, they've, they've, they've now lived through a U.S. and the Western-dominated um, economy, global economy, and they see that they don't gain anything from it. So they now try to gain something from China. And uh, on February the 6th, so like uh, almost I think two months ago or, or six weeks ago, um, Argentine joined the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and again, this was a very interesting clip. I want to show it here. It's just a... Uh, 我们现在做的工作当时教育就是让大家不忘这个初心，为人民服务。我们没有自己的利益，我觉得你是一个非常有理想的人，有理念的人，也专门去看我们的当时吧。我们愿意和你进一步加强啊，党纪交流。Conoc
como bien ha dicho usted, compartimos una misma filosofía de política que pone al hombre como centro de la política. Sí, sí, está bien. Que esté muy bien. Medio con chandán, yo medio sin chongo. <laughs> and again, the um, government of um, Argentine is not a you know revolutionary communist government. I think uh, Fernandez is um, a left-leaning social democrat. So it's not that these are like um, extreme, ex like leftist extremists or radicals or whatever. It's just. Argentine realized that joining the BRI, they will gain economic benefits from it. And um, to su so to summarize, basically, um, NATO and EU are deeply divided. NATO and EU are saying we are unified, but in fact we see, for example, the NATO country in the, of Turkey not joining the sanctions and even trying to be ambivalent and to facilitate peace talks. So, or example, for example, um, people like Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron is against um, NATO because um, you could argue that Emmanuel Macron was more of a he, he favored a own European army right so again we we see how Europe is divided there are forces who want to align with um, the United States and there are forces who want to create a rivaling imperial bloc um, Merkel the, the German Chancellor Merkel was such a person she played both sides and so basically tried to create a rivaling bloc. But now the government in Germany is a government by the um, SPD, the Social Democrats and the Green Party. And the Green Party is a so-called synthetic leftist party. So it's, it's, um, it's, sh it's uh, like, um, it's playing the leftist card. They behave like they are leftists, but they don't do any leftist policies. And in fact, um, the Green Party for the last, you know, six, seven, eight years was against um, the against Nord Stream two. So the Green Party is pretty much a, a, a you can argue a foreign agent of the United States. Um, the the they are they whenever it, the United States wants to to warfare, you know, Yugoslavia, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. The Green or or Libya, the Green Party is always the first to join uh, the United States. So we see how. The EU, the imperialists, so to say, the capitalist elites in, in, in the European Union are divided. There are some who favor um, this divorce from Russia and there are some who realize that we're now completely colonized, so to say, by we, or we're now completely at the feet of the United States. And in this global realignment, you have to realize everyone is a loser. Right? So the people in the Donbass, the ordinary people are losers. Ukraine, are the ordinary people are losers. The European people are losers. Russian people are losers. Everyone, this is a lose, 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 lose situation. No one is benefiting from it. Um, but the reality is that, in my opinion, the EU is the biggest loser. And the United States more or less achieved its goal. So you could argue the United States is actually a winner. Right? Because this was a long-stated goal to sever the ties Europe had to Russia. And in fact, if you go back in history, um, the Soviet Union, after the Second World War, was much in favor of a unified, neutral Germany. Um, but the, the United States created NATO and Western Germany immediately had to join NATO. Why? Because the United States knows that Germany um, and even a neutral Germany will sooner or later um, deepen its ties with um, with Asia, with the Eurasian uh, bloc. This is simply for ge geographical and geopolitical reasons. And uh, so the United States is trying to sever Europe from Russia, Europe from Asia. And in fact, if you watch the news, right, if you watch Master Media, you realize that um, the West is in deep denial of reality. Like we live in a society, we, if you hear the news, we are constantly being told that, you know, Russia is failing. No one will, will want to trade with Russia anymore. Um, uh, Putin is not only destroying Ukraine, but he's also destroying Russia. And I think in reality, we see that the capitalist West is in, I mean, Russia is also capitalist, right? But capitalism is in, is in huge crisis. 
with the COVID pandemic, the West was completely overwhelmed by the COVID pandemic. They managed to do one quarantine um, for a few months, for two or three months, but they've now completed all their all their resources and the West cannot do another quarantine. It's, it's uh, too many people will lose their jobs, will lose their economic life, will lose their will lose everything they have. And so the West, no, we have a very strong right wing sector who are against m more COVID restrictions because um, they lost everything during the, the pandemic. They lost all their um, capital. Um, and so we have COVID. Then we have this hard um, divorce from Russia, meaning that we will see enormous uh, energy um, crisis in Europe um, if they don't find an alternative. And Europe can only trade um, oil in ruble now, right? the large parts of Europe. Um, and so the alternative would be uh, liquefied gas from the UAE or Saudi Arabia, but this is extremely expensive. And the United States had, has the problem that um, it, it, it basically wants to wage warfare against Russia and China at the same time. But the thing is, um, China currently um, has to buy oil from the UAE. So if the United States is lowering the price of oil, that so uh, to lowering the price of oil will benefit China, but increasing the price of oil will benefit Russia. Right? So whatever the United States is doing when it comes to oil or Europe is doing, either China or Russia will gonna win from from will will gonna benefit from this. Um, and this is basically a yeah, it's an it's the it's policies done by an overstretched empire. Um, and I would argue that this denial of reality is by design because the working classes of the West, which um, are living in a fairy tale, you have to many people are not really class conscious. Um, so the ordinary people are not class conscious. And we have this very dominant ideological mindset of neoliberalism here in Europe. And the working classes of the West are going to bear the consequences. And so they have to be kept dormant. They have to be told that everything is okay. Like we are gonna be fine. It's gonna be Russia that is gonna be in crisis. And um, we see the capitalist oligarchs of the West in a huge crisis. So this means we have increased um, increasement of weapons exports and um, the United States just um, right now is talking about doubling their um, their um, military spending in Germany we ha again we have this very militaristic Green Party and the uh, the red party the SPD which is being played like a fiddle um, and they had a, a, as a stated goal in their coalition treaty um, when they when they took, took office they had a stated goal that they want to increase um, military spending, but they now increased it to 150 billion dollar uh, euros. So Germany now has the biggest military spending, and this is uh, is done deliberately because um, they keep uh, they have to keep making profits, and this can when when the rest of the economy is in crisis, they will try to you know do it through weapon exports, and we see price gouging for gasoline, etc. and so what does this mean for ordinary people like you and me? It means um, we see how this conflict has been created completely artificial and it is not being created because of morality or human rights or whatever. This is about keeping dominance over the world, keeping dominance in the new developing economy. And you, ask, you have to ask yourself as a European, as an American, um, is this in your personal interest that, you know, the capitalist class, the capitalist elites, the political elites are basically playing war while the ordinary people are suffering. And so the question is, you should realize that this war is being manufactured. You could instantly end this war. You could have um, instantly ended the conditions that led to this war, right? This war has been manufactured over the last, I would argue, 10 years or even 20, 30 years. And um, this this is all done artificially and not in the name of you know the German people or the American people. It's done in, in order to keep capitalist gains. Um, yeah. Um, and there has never been an empire that has given up its hegemony without a fight. And again, I, I want to um, reiterate what the Venezuelan president said. He said, we're already living in a third world war, but it's only on an economic um, phase right now. 
And of course, with capitalism in crises, we see we'll see a sharpening class conflict, and this means that all other types of conflict will also be sharpened. This means class divides, the poor and the rich, or racial divides, you know, white people against black people, or Asian people, or Russian people, or gender divides between men and women will increase, and we see a rise of this of fascist ideology, and we see we'll also see a rise of um, this synthetic left, right? This in Germany, it's the Green Party. Um, this 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 fake left, this fake progressive left, um, that is in fact um, doing when it comes to economic terms or to geopolitical terms, is identical to right wing um, parties. Um, okay, and so I want to end with a good note. So because I'm almost finished now, when capitalism is in crisis, revolutionary times emerge. And here I want to quote two people. Rosa Luxemburg famously said, before a revolution happens, it is perceived as impossible. And after it happens, it will be seen as having been inevitable. And um, Ursula Le Guin said, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. And last but not least, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite people, my boy, Malcolm X. If you're not careful, the newspaper will have you hating the people who are being oppressed. And loving the people who are doing the oppression. Oppression. So um, I hope you've learned something from this talk, um, and feel free to ask questions now.